Hello church, as promised, I am back to tell you about Joseph. By now you probably know this is about the Joseph in the left half of your Bible, not the Joseph in the right half. We have covered three weeks of Joseph's life and we have four more to go. Joseph's story is really about when life gets tough and we go through hard things. It is very easy to get sad, mad, and react badly when those things happen to us. The question we get to ask ourselves is do we respond or react? When we trust that God has a plan for those hard things, we get to respond with faith. We aren't always responsible for those things that happen, but we are always responsible for the choices we make in those times. I've heard that timing is everything. I don't really understand it always, but everyone says it, so it must be right, right? I do know what it's like to wait, and I don't like it. Waiting on Christmas, waiting on my birthday, or waiting on the end of the school year. Those are all hard. My dad tells me not to wish my life away. I have no idea what that means, though. But God's timing is perfect, and sometimes we do have to wait. But I do believe that eventually God will give us an opportunity, and then it's up to us to obey. Joseph waited a long time for an opportunity. When it finally came, he knew it was from God, and he obeyed. Let's learn from this part of Joseph's life and be ready to obey when our opportunity comes to. In the words of Enoch, take it away, Pastor Rick. No. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. No. Let's pray. We didn't miss the moment, did we? Father, thank you for my friends. And I pray that as we open your word, as we open our hearts, that you'd speak to us because we need to hear from you. A simple message today, but one that we can not just take with us, but apply to our lives as we all will relate in one way or another. So we are here to be changed by you. We expect you to do that. And we look forward to it in Jesus name. Amen. So I told you last week when we got started, I shared with you a story uh, about my yard, about my trees. And uh, some of you were very concerned about that, thinking that I might be that neighbor that has the overgrown yard and the terrible trees and the weeds. And I'm not that neighbor. Our goal in our neighborhood is to keep our yard at say like a six out of 10 in the comparison of yards around us, maybe seven to where it's not like a show yard. We're not going to be on any tour of homes or yards, but it's not that yard where everyone's looking at it saying, oh, it needs to be cut or weeded, you know, just right there in the middle. But somebody complained about my trees and I shared that with you and I was a little salty about it and they had complained. It was anonymous and they said oh, my trees weren't eight feet above the sidewalk. And I mentioned to you last week that we had an inspector come to my house and, and look at my trees and he told me we had to cut them. He said he was sorry because most people's trees weren't eight feet above the sidewalk. You remember the story I shared with you. So I had to cut the trees and I didn't want to. And it wasn't because I didn't really want to go out and trim my trees. It's because somebody else told me I had to. And I wanted to find out the neighbor that had reported me. So if any of you know them, let me know because I have some things planned as far as, no, I wouldn't do that that you know of, but I didn't want to trim them. It was a pride thing. My wife, she said, we need to go trim the trees. They gave us a deadline. We're going to get a fine. And I said, okay, I want to trim them in the dead of the night because um, I don't want anybody to see me trimming them. It was admitting defeat to be out there on the side of, of where the two major streets that I live on, uh, where people driving by, it'll be somebody who complained about us, somebody who turned us in, seeing me trim my trees, and they'll think they won. And so Joy said, come on, grow up, which Joy says to me a lot. Let's go outside and trim the trees. So about five o'clock one afternoon after Work was over, I went out with my electric chainsaw and uh, started trimming the trees, but people were driving by. And as people were driving by, I got angrier and angrier because I just knew one of them was the one who turned me in and they were gonna gloat, they were gonna have a party, they were gonna text their wife and brag about how they made the neighbors trim their trees. And so I scowled at every person that drove by. I mean, I gave them the angry eyes, every single person. And Joy said, what are you doing? And I said, Joy, you have no idea how much restraint that I'm showing. And she said, you're, you're mean mugging all of our neighbors. And I said, yes, but I want to show each one of them the no-no finger. So I'm showing restraint with each person who drives by. And she looked at me and she said, put on your big boy pants and deal with it. Stuff like this builds character. That's what my wife said to me. And I know that, that she's right that doing things we don't want to do builds character in places we don't want to be around people who we may think have turned us in. That sometimes we just do things because they're the right things to do. And character is built oftentimes in situations, well, that we, were, we wish were a little different. The story with Joseph is no different, only the circumstances are so much greater. 
instead of it being some trees needing to be trimmed on a, a nice 75 degree afternoon, he had terrible things happen to him. Beaten, left for dead by his brothers. Sold into slavery, falsely accused and imprisoned for a crime he didn't commit. Forgotten, alone, abandoned, and then ultimately restored to a position of influence. But what impresses me about Joseph's story is not who he became, and we'll see that today, the beginning of his becoming what's next, but how he became that person. And the fact that he became successful and developed character while he was going through all of the things that, that we've studied and read about so far. It appears to me, or occurs to me, that reputation is something that you and I can't control. Reputation is something that has to do with who we are or who people think we are when everybody else is looking. But character is what you and I can control, and that is who we are, how we act and what we believe when nobody else is looking. Character is what Joseph showed. It's what made him blessable. So today we're going to be turning the corner in Joseph's life. Things are going to be looking up for him. And things, well, opportunities, influence, success. But I want you to focus on a couple things as we uh, prepare to open this story or look at this story together. Number one is Joseph became a person of uncommon faith before he was ever given an opportunity visibly to exercise that faith. And number two, God was always working behind the scenes in his life, always had reasons for the things that were going on, even though Joseph did not understand God's reasoning. There's a quote by a man named A.W. Tozer that I find interesting. It troubled me this last week, so it's one I want to share with you as we get started this morning. And the quote's very simple. It's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Now, we know God doesn't willfully, intentionally inflict harm or damage on a person in a way that is supposed to hurt them. But I trust you understand the spirit of the quote, that sometimes God allows us to go through really difficult times and circumstances to build the kind of character within us that allows us to be used greatly by God, to find what's next, to see God's purpose for our life. Maybe it looks like visible success on the outside, like Joseph's life, maybe it's not the kind of success that you and I really want in the first place. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that God works all things together for good. He works the good things together and the bad things together to bring about good, but it's morally, intrinsically, spiritually good. It may not look like the things or the goals that we have, the desires for our own lives. For some of us, we'll struggle. We won't ever see this external, visible sort of outward success until we see heaven. But along the way, the journey of life, God can create in us something that allows him to use us in ways that not only will surprise us, but make our life far more meaningful than it ever would be if we were calling our own shots. I want you to listen to the scripture. We're going to unfold this next chapter in the story, come back and talk about it briefly and then we're going to hear a testimony from somebody who is going through some similar things that Joseph went through as we sort of apply this to our life and commit to go and live a different way. Genesis 41. Two years had passed in the story where we find Joseph waiting in prison when he is asked to interpret a dream. This time, the dream came from Pharaoh. In his dream, Pharaoh was standing by the Nile River. Seven healthy cows came up out of the Nile followed by seven other skinny, unhealthy cows. The skinny cows ate the seven healthy cows, but they stayed thin and unhealthy. Then Pharaoh woke up. He went back to sleep and dreamed a second time. Seven ears of grain, full-bodied and lush, grew out of a single stalk. Then seven more ears grew up, but these were thin and dried out by the east wind. The thin ears swallowed up the full, healthy ears. Then Pharaoh woke up again. When morning came, he was upset. He sent for all the magicians and sages of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but they couldn't interpret them to him. The head cupbearer then spoke up and said to Pharaoh, I just now remembered something. I'm sorry. I should have told you this long ago. 
After you locked me and the baker in the prison, we both had dreams on the same night. It so happened that there was a young Hebrew slave there with us. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us. Things turned out just as he interpreted. I was returned to my position, and the head baker was impaled. Pharaoh at once sent for Joseph. They brought him in a hurry from the jail cell. He cut his hair, put on clean clothes, and came to Pharaoh. I dreamed a dream, Pharaoh told Joseph. Nobody can interpret it, but I've heard that just by hearing a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered, Not I, but God. God will set Pharaoh's mind at ease. When Pharaoh had told Joseph his two dreams, he said, I've told all this to the magicians, but they can't figure it out. Joseph said to Pharaoh, Your two dreams both mean the same thing. God is telling you what he is going to do. The meaning is this. Seven years of plenty are on their way to Egypt, but on their heels will come seven years of famine, leaving no trace of the Egyptian plenty. The fact that Pharaoh dreamed the same dream twice emphasizes God's determination to do this and do it soon. So Pharaoh needs to look for a wise and experienced man and put him in charge of the country. Then appoint managers throughout the country of Egypt. Their job will be to organize it during the years of plenty. This way, the country won't be devastated by the famine. This seemed like a good idea to Pharaoh and his officials, so he asked them, Isn't this the man we need? Are we going to find anyone else who has God's spirit in him like this? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, You're the man for us. God has given you the inside story. No one is as qualified as you in experience and wisdom. From now on, you're in charge of all my affairs. All my people will report to you. Only as king will I be over you. Right then, Pharaoh commissioned Joseph. He told him, I am Pharaoh. But no one in Egypt will make a single move without your stamp of approval. He gave Joseph the signet ring from his own hand, the best robes available, a gold chain for his neck, and Egypt's second best chariot. Finally, Pharaoh gave Joseph an Egyptian name, which means God speaks and he lives. After this, Joseph oversaw the entire country of Egypt, and the people cheered for him as he went along. He was only 30 years old when he went to work for Pharaoh the king of Egypt. So the temptation we have is to live our life for what's next, to always be looking at the next stage. For some people, it's uh, life will be different when we graduate from high school. For some, it'll be when I graduate from college. For some, we think life is going to be different or better when I get married or when I'm not married. For some, when I get the job. For some, possibly when I get promoted. For some, maybe when I retire, things will be different. Life will get better. For some who are lonely, it's when they find a friend. For some who are sick, life will get better when I get well. We have a tendency or a temptation to live our lives for what's next. And if we do that, we fail to embrace the power of the moment that God has us in. The power of the moment now. So we're going to see what's next for Joseph, but I want to remind you that as we examine what's next for Joseph, that he didn't simply walk into what was next without making the most of the moments that he had along the way. He grew into a person of character through pain, through trial, through testing, and then finally, we see a page turn, a new chapter in his life, and we'll look at that together. When two full years had passed since the cupbearer and the baker had forgotten Joseph, Pharaoh had yet another dream. Now think about the dreams and the situation that Joseph had with dreams. He had dreams when he was a kid. The dreams got him into trouble. He had dreams that he chose to share. When he chose to share the dreams, it got him beaten up by his brothers. It got him thrown into a pit. It got him sold into slavery. And so there were certain things in Joseph's life that may have been triggers, that may have been off limits. For me, dreams would certainly have been one of those. Pharaoh had a dream. He fell asleep again, and he had a second dream. Now, the dreams you heard from our narration were dreams that were troubling to him, and they were simple dreams. One was about cows. There were a number of cows, seven cows, and these seven cows were healthy and came up out of the river. And there were seven sickly cows who came up and ate the cows that were healthy. 
And then he had another dream, and there were seven really healthy grains of wheat that were growing on a kernel or on a stalk, and then there were seven that weren't, and so he wanted an interpretation. And these dreams, they weren't that complicated, but he couldn't figure them out. Even his magicians couldn't figure them out. And in the morning, his mind was troubled, so he sent for all of the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told him his dreams, but no one could interpret them. So Joseph is just doing what Joseph has been doing. He's been in prison. He's been hanging out with prisoners, being faithful, being a person of courage, choosing to live in an uncommon way. A person who chooses to make hard decisions, even though they may bring difficult consequences. A person who chooses to show love and concern for others. A person who chooses to look beyond his own limited circumstance and see how he might influence the people who God has put in his life. Joseph, still in prison, a forgotten Hebrew in a foreign land. And so the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember a guy who interpreted my dreams. I should have told you about this years ago, but I didn't. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph and was quickly brought from the dungeon, Joseph was, where he had shaved and changed his clothes. He came before Pharaoh. Here's his big chance. Things in his life may, in fact, look up. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now, here's the challenge. Joseph could have stepped in and could have said, this is my moment. I've earned it. Yes, it's me. I know how to interpret dreams. He could have taken all of the attention and put him on, on himself. But in fact, he didn't because he had learned two things through his life so far. He learned that the adversity that he'd been through had given him a soft heart, and the challenges that he had been through had given him a humble spirit, where he realized that he wasn't simply doing God a favor by serving the Lord, but that he, in fact, was a person of uncommon faith who had developed character along the way, watching God's strength work even when he was in impossible circumstances. So instead of stepping into a moment that wasn't his to step into, taking credit for all of the final success and recognition in his life that he had finally achieved, that he probably thought he may have earned in his shadow self, he resisted the temptation to take the spotlight. He resisted the temptation to say, I'm your dream guy. Resisted the temptation to say, yep, you found him, Joseph, the dream interpreter. But in fact, even in this moment where he could have made it all about him, he pointed even Pharaoh back to the Lord. And Joseph said, I cannot do it. Now there's power in that statement. In your life right now, you should be in your faith, in your walk with God, consistently in situations that are a little bit beyond you, that are stretching you a little bit beyond where you're comfortable, where you simply have to tell the Lord, I can't do it. For some, it's a struggle with belief. For some, it's a struggle for obedience. For some, it's a struggle to overcome the past. For some, maybe even a struggle to step into the future and to what God has for you next. We should always be in a situation with the Lord where we're stretched a little bit further than what we're comfortable with. And he says some honest words, some words that I find myself saying, some words that I hope you find yourself saying as we deal with both the good things in life and also the challenging things in life. I cannot do it myself. Why? I don't control all of the billions and contingencies of life to bring about my own plan. I wish I did, but I don't. I don't control all of the billions of contingencies in life to bring about my plan, but God does. God controls the billions of contingencies in life. God brings people into our lives and circumstances and opportunities that allows us to have meaning and significance, but you and I are unable to bring any of these things into our own lives. We can't find God's will for our life. We can't even figure out what we should do next. So Joseph says these very honest words, the same words that I hope you're comfortable with and the words that I've become very comfortable with, I cannot do it. I'm not wise enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not talented enough. But do you know who can do it? God can do it. This is a person who's been to the bottom 
and who has watched God over and over and over again show himself faithful. Can you relate to that? I mean, maybe you're not there right now. Maybe you're not at the bottom. Maybe you feel pretty good about things. But if you've lived any period of time, if you have any kind of experience to you, to your name, to your, to your own life and existence, you know that life isn't always good. Sometimes we go through things. And when we find ourselves at the worst possible moments in life, and we think there's nothing else for us to cling to except the Lord, and we reach out in desperation and we call for help, isn't it amazing how he's always there? And if we let him and we trust him, he gives us the strength not just to endure, but he gives us the insight to understand his love and sometimes the wisdom to develop character along the way. You see, Joseph was getting his chance right now. But he had become a man of uncommon courage. From everything, simple things, but really big things, like saying no to Potiphar's wife, knowing that it would bring consequences. A person who chose to live in a different way. A person who had a vision about his life that was different than maybe everyone else had for his life. When he was propositioned, he said, you know, I see myself a different way. I see myself as belonging to God. I see myself as having a future. I respect my master, but I also respect the Lord. I can't live that way. I've made an agreement with God. A person of discipline who was willing to say no to himself, to work hard in situations he didn't want to work, in places he didn't want to be around, people he didn't even like, but he applied himself and God blessed him for it. A person who had consistently shown love, tough love, sacrificial love, truth in love, radical love. He developed in all of these times a character that brought him into this moment. And when Pharaoh asked him, here it is, interpret my dream, he said, I can't do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answers that he desires. And now, let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man because Joseph had given him the interpretation of the dream. Joseph said, look, the dreams are simple. God told me. So I'm going to tell you. He said, there are going to be some years of famine. And these years of famine are going to follow some years of abundance. And you have to be smart enough and wise enough to be able to store up enough grain and enough food during the years of abundance so that you can endure the years of famine. And it's going to take a wise administrator because Egypt had been in expansion mode. They're busy building pyramids and temples and spending as much money as they could possibly make because they were experiencing a lot of material blessing. And so Joseph said, you're going to need an administrator, somebody who can tighten the belt, somebody who can prepare for the famine that's coming, because if you don't, then you're going to die. And then Pharaoh was told that he needed to look for a discerning and wise man to put in charge of the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there's no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all of my people are submit to you and your orders. And the only person in the entire land that will be greater than me is you. And the Bible says that he put a ring on Joseph's finger and a chain on his neck and he set him loose with influence and a job. And this is great news for Joseph. Now, I would have asked some questions had I been Joseph because he'd been here before, right? He'd been in trouble and then he'd been restored and he'd been in trouble and he'd been restored and I think I might have asked Pharaoh, do you have a wife? <laughs> and does she like Hebrew men who are rugged and handsome? Remember, that's how it all started with Potiphar's wife. I want to make sure Pharaoh, he'd be like, well, why do you ask? And Joseph could say, well, I'm just asking for a friend because you wouldn't want to get into another situation like that. I mean, Pharaoh, working for him could have even been worse than working for Potiphar. I mean, you talk about Pharaoh who was displeased from time to time with his employees. I mean, he had a, a, a baker impaled and his head removed. So was it good news? Well, we know it was good news because we know the story, but for Joseph, it was still kind of touch and go. But I don't want you to get caught up in the fact that Joseph had all of a sudden cashed in. That he'd all of a sudden arrived at a spot where he had influence, where he had resources. Even get caught up in the fact that he was able to protect his people as you'll see in coming weeks, and preserve the line of Christ. But I want you to think about the fact that he didn't become great 
after he became great. And he didn't become a person of character after he had arrived at a place where everyone else in the land saw his character. That God had developed in him something that was useful by taking him places and through things that if he could have avoided, and if you and I could avoid, we would avoid at all cost. So as we turn the corner in this Joseph story and talk about the influence God gave him and the success, I want to ask you, how are you waiting for what's next? Are you living your life looking for that next stage or that next step? Are you dissatisfied and impatient with where you are right now? Are you restless? Is your heart becoming softer and your spirit more humble? Are you becoming harder and a little more preoccupied with self? Because you can go two ways in these periods and only we can choose. And what I'd like for you to do is listen to a testimony from one of our friends, Crystal, who's going through a time, much like some of the times that Joseph went through, and she's choosing to go through these times well. Hi, my name's Crystal Matheny, and I'm not good at waiting, especially not waiting well. So when I talked to Pastor Rick about a testimony, he joked and said, start with that. So there you go. I've had situations in my life that went full circle in terms of waiting. Waiting, but also seeing the end or the outcome. And then now in the rearview mirror, I can see God's faithfulness and trust that God will be faithful now. But what do I do in the midst of the agony of waiting when I can't see that finish line? For the last 18 years, I worked as a vice president overseeing large contracts with the U.S. government. I didn't love my job, but I knew my job, and it was financial security for our family, and I did it well. The business was sold in April of this year, and that left me unemployed for the first time in my life since I was 14 years old doing summer jobs. To date, I've submitted 94 job applications. I'm still unemployed and still waiting. And while in the midst of waiting on what God's going to do in my next career, 10 days ago, I went in for a routine, should be easy, kidney stone removal surgery. Granted, I've had this done five times before. I even joked with a friend that I might schedule a workout for that Friday afternoon. But when I woke up in the recovery room with a smile on my face, thinking it meant I would soon feel relief, Jared quickly grabbed my hand and gently told me the bad news. No kidney stone removal and a kidney stent for two weeks, followed by another surgery and another kidney stent. Man, I really just wanted to wake up to feel better and have relief from pain. But here I sit, again, waiting. Being content with waiting on God's timing and uncertain seasons in my life has been far from easy. It's a daily battle of choosing joy. And on days when I don't feel like it, I don't feel like trusting or waiting, that's when I rely on what God says is true. God reminds me of his faithfulness in my life. He's been faithful every single time before. So why wouldn't he be faithful now? In my job uncertainty, in my health. I'm so thankful for Joseph's example because being in the midst of waiting is hard, but I can trust God despite my feelings and my circumstances. God sees the whole picture. The waiting period has a purpose. So my aim is to wait well. So developing a, an uncommon faith, that's what we want. And all of us in our lives are at different stages. Some are identifying with Joseph in his before, and some identifying with Joseph in his after. But in a sense, waiting unites all of us. Because all of us, all of us who are followers of Jesus, all of us who put our faith in Christ and Jesus and Jesus alone, and let me explain what that means. For all of us who have 
confessed our sin and our sinfulness, who have decided to believe who Jesus is, and who've asked him to be in charge and Lord of our lives, for all of us, we're all waiting on something. And what we're waiting for is for Jesus to come again, or for our lives to be over, our biological lives, and for us to go to heaven to be with him. But we don't wait and waste. We don't wait and worry. We wait with intention. Because what we do right now matters. And God grows character in us as we all wait. Let me show you the difference between responding and reacting. A person who reacts to times of waiting and difficult circumstances, a person who reacts often becomes impatient with God. They look beyond their situation and they wait to get the better life they think they deserve. They wait to get the better life they think they deserve. But a Christian, a person of uncommon faith, responds to times of waiting and difficult circumstances by trusting that God is always working and that difficult circumstances make our heart soft and make our spirit humble. And just like Joseph, who wanted his bad circumstances to change, Well, he didn't allow these difficult circumstances to make him hard-hearted, jaded, and bitter. He became softer and more useful to the Lord. But waiting has to be one of the hardest things that you and I could ever do. We want what we want, and we want it now. And we can become impatient and entitled and impose a timeline and a set of expectations on God that are simply above our pay grade. When I look at Joseph, what speaks to me more than anything else is not the person he becomes, and we're going to see that over the next three weeks, but it's how he became that person. And the only way you and I can become that person is by embracing the moment that we have right now. Now. Now is the only time that we're guaranteed. You're not guaranteed you're next. You're not guaranteed to see the graduation, the promotion, the retirement, the marriage, the healing, the end. Now is the only moment that we're guaranteed And it's the moment that we're held responsible for. The past is behind. We do our best to make amends when necessary. We learn from the past. We allow regret to be a powerful motivator. But right now is the moment where we can give ourselves to the Lord, where we can say yes, where we can allow him to do the hard work of building courage and vision and discipline and love. Now is the moment in whatever the circumstance that we can allow God to do these God things in us that develop this uncommon faith. What speaks to me about the Joseph story is not just what he achieves, and we'll see all that he achieves, but it's the dozens of people who he influenced while he was in Potiphar's household. All of whom were somewhere they didn't want to be. Doing something they didn't want to be doing. The two years that he spent in prison, the hundreds of people that he was able to influence as he developed uncommon faith, allowing them to see his uncommon faith, and perhaps even to rely on the same God that Joseph worshiped and served, they did these kind of things in the most unusual ways. So I want to pray for you, and as we close our time, I want to challenge you, I want to ask you, what are you allowing God to do 
in you and through you while you wait. Father, thank you for my friends. 